Last week we introduced the various doctrines of men that are associated uh, with the observance of the Lord's Supper. And some of them are uh, uh, denominational in origin, others are particular to our brotherhood. And so we listed some of these, and, and just uh, if, you, if you're writing in your notebook, say for the first time, or you're taking notes, that we said that we were going to start uh, with these, what we call, I call these, these big, these big three, which is the doctrine of transubstantiation, the doctrine of consubstantiation, I found out a little more about that in my research. We look at the frequency, uh, different ideas about the frequency of the observance, and that forgiveness uh, is received through the observance of the Lord's Supper. And then down on our left, as I said, on my left column, I looked at some other things, such as the idea of closed communion, that, uh, that people are excluded in some services from the observance of the Supper. Many of our Baptist friends practice what is called closed communion. Only those that are members of that congregation uh, uh, can, can be there and participate. Also, we'll look at some of the things pertaining to the concept or the ideas of the terminology associated with the Lord's Supper. Now, this is not necessarily the order that we're going to deal with, but these are some of the things that we will discuss, such as uh, the, the uh, word Eucharist or the concept of the emblems being referred to as sacraments. Uh, I remember for the first time ever hearing a, a brother in Christ uh, make uh, that statement as I was uh, taking the Lord's Supper to one of our shut-ins at, at Eastwood Street. And he made a, a reference to me bringing the sacraments, and I'd never heard that in my whole life. And so that we'll look at some of the terminology associated with Eucharist, sacraments, mass, uh, things of that nature. And then uh, some of the things that, uh, that are peculiar to the brotherhood, although this one would not be, the idea of singing during the Lord's Supper, that I uh, saw that for the first time uh, in the uh, late 1980s in Nashville, and some of that still goes on. Uh, the doctrine pertaining to one cup, uh, the doctrine of unworthy to partake, or the, the concept. And uh, in, in more modern times, the idea of having the individual pieces that are already in the, in the uh, uh, bread plate, is it, is it still considered breaking bread if you don't literally break bread? And so we'll look at some of that, and then we'll look at the use of the, 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 uh, the idea of alcoholic, the use of, of uh, alcoholic wine uh, in the observance of the supper, so these are the things that these are the things that uh, that will be discussed, and I hope you have those written down. If you don't, I I'll, uh, I've got them written on. I've got them written, and several of you commented uh, last week, either in person or on text messages or whatnot, some things that you wanted discussed, and we'll deal we'll deal with all of these as we make our way uh, through these uh, these particular. Uh, Issues. Now, I want us to deal first of all and primarily with the doctrine of, uh, of uh, transubstantiation. By the way, does everybody have all these written down? Because I don't know if I've got them written anywhere else but right here. What's that second one? It's like my baptism. Oh, Saturday and Sunday, partake, partaking at weddings, baptisms, partaking on Thursday, partaking monthly, quarterly, or annually. Hey, you got your phone? Let me have it real quick. I'm going to take a picture of this so I don't forget all these. I want to make sure. I usually take a picture before I start racing, then I start racing. It reminded me. All right. Thanks, man. Okay. I just want to make sure. Now, I gave you, I gave you a heads up. I gave you a heads up on transubstantiation telling you that we would be dealing out of John chapter 6. In this discussion, so I want you to go ahead and open your Bibles to John 6. The verse that is under consideration, the verse under consideration in John 6 uh, is, for example, uh, verse 51 and verse 53 and 4, where it says, I am the living bread which has come down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And it says, most assuredly, verse 53, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, 
and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And so there's been a lot of confusion as to what, as to what uh, that statement means, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, false teaching, particularly that has been uh, uh, propagated by Roman Catholicism in this connection. Uh, one should understand that the doctrine of transubstantiation is the doctrine that in the partaking of the Lord's Supper, the bread that you eat literally becomes the flesh of Jesus Christ. And the, and the fruit of the vine, when you drink it, becomes the literal, literal it, it miraculously changes into the literal flesh and blood of the Lord Jesus. Now, that was one of a number of issues that brought about uh, the, uh, the Pro uh, Protestant Reformation. Uh, for example, John uh, uh, Wycliffe or Wycliffe uh, in the late 14th century, that would be in the late 1300s, uh, began to teach against the doctrine of transubstantiation. Uh, Martin Luther, who is generally regarded as the father of the Protestant Reformation in 1517, uh, denied the doctrine of transubstantiation, but instead taught the doctrine of consubstantiation, which is really nothing more than a, philo a, a philosophical idea that can't be proven or disproven, so to speak. In other words, he, reject he rejected this, but he had to come up with something different. And the doctrine of consubstantiation is the bread and the fruit of the vine don't change, but somehow the literal bread and blood, or the literal flesh and blood of Jesus is somehow present in the observance of the supper. In other words, there's not a miraculous change, but somehow they are present in a in a real way. So there, in other words, it's just kind of this, it's just kind of this nebulous idea that, that you really can't put your mind on. In other words, it, it's not something hard and fast. Now, in connection to this, let me add this to this list. And I, I may mention a whip group. And that's the doctrine of what was called of Lollardy. Lollardy. Now, Lollard is a derogatory term that Catholics and, Epip uh, and Anglicans used against John Wycliffe. And it, it was used in the same sense that people would refer to us as Campbellites. All right? A Lollard is a person who is uneducated or not formally trained. And so because Wycliffe had the Bible translated into English, he was condemned by all of the hierarchies because Catholic hierarchy and Anglican hierarchy did not want the language of the Bible to be in the hands of, or didn't want the Bible to be in the language of the people. As long as they could tell the people what the Bible said, they held control over them. So the Bible was always read in Latin. But Wycliffe and some others translated the Bible into English, and William Tyndale was on rec is on record as saying, uh, when they opposed him for putting the Bible in English, he said, I'll make a plowboy know more about the Bible than you. He was talking to a Catholic priest. And so anybody who wanted to uh, 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 follow Wycliffe was called a lawler, and Wycliffe denied transubstantiation and he denied Luther's, what eventually became Luther's version of consubstantiation. So I'm just throwing this out there. You, you, if you're doing your research, you might, you might come across this word, all right? I have never heard this in 51 years of living until I started studying this a little bit closer. And so these are various ideas about the Lord's Supper, but we're going to focus on this one. We're going to focus on transubstantiation from John chapter 6. Now, in order to have a proper understanding of what Jesus is saying in John's, the latter part there of John 6, we have to work our way, we have to work our way backward through the text all the way back to verse 1. All the way back to verse 1. In John 6, verses 1 through, uh, 
in verses, let's say, 1 through 21, we have the account of Jesus feeding a multitude, okay? He miraculously fed a multitude of people. They had been following him. Jesus gets in a boat on the, there on the seashore and goes across the sea, goes to another place. Well, when the people figure out that he has gone, they start trying to find him. So they walked around the seashore until they found Jesus. And they said in verse number uh, 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Here comes a statement. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you, because the Father has set his seal on him. And so now, here is, here is the setting. Jesus has fed this multitude. They're following him because he's feeding them. And he says, this is not the food you need to be concerned with. By the way, we have almost a similar statement in John 4 with the woman at the well about water. Remember? Jesus said, I've got water that if you drink of it, what? You'll never thirst again. So she says, give me this water so that I don't have to come here and draw water anymore. So then he says, go fetch your husband. Of course, we know how that, that whole thing played out. But when Jesus said he had water that if they were to drink, they would never thirst again, was he talking about real water? No. No. He was talking about, he was talking about his doctrine. That if a person would receive his teaching, that it would last, that it would last forever, unlike physical water, which only temporarily satisfies. And so the reason I mention that is, is that Jesus has already on record as making a statement about water or substance, or sustenance, I should say, that is a metaphor. Alright? So now we're going to talk about the metaphor in John 6. All right. What I want us to do is just kind of run a little commentary through John 6 because it's a very lengthy reading and we don't want to spend all of our time reading from beginning to end. All right. And so what I want us to do is having, understand, having an understanding now of the context, I want us to jump forward to verse number 28. To verse 28. After, after Jesus says, don't labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to everlasting life, and I'm going to give it to you. They said, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? No, they said, he said, don't labor, don't work for, not for temporary food, work for eternal food. And so they're asking the question, what work must we do? What is the work that we are supposed to do that we can have this food? Look at Jesus' answer in verse 29. This is the work of God. This is the work that I'm commanding you to do. What? What's say? Say it again, Sean. That you believe on him who he has sent. That you believe on him who has sent me. So Jesus says, labor, labor for, and I'm just I'm just gonna kind of summarize. Labor for the eternal food. All right, that's verse 27. And then Jesus said in response that belief in him is that food. Does that make sense? That's, that's what he said, right? What must we do to labor for this food? He said, believe in him whom he has sent. Now, note verse uh, 30 and 31. The Jews asked for a sign. What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe in you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So the Jews are now looking for some sign whereby they can justify believing in him, which I find particularly odd because he just fed a multitude earlier, and that's why they were where they were at that time. In other words, have they not already seen enough? 
But now they're going to say, what sign will you give us that, that, we should, that we should believe? Now, let's pause here. Hold your mark there. If, if you have to turn your Bible, go back to John 5 and verse 38. Let's go to verse 37. Or 36. 36. John 5, 36. Jesus says, in regard to this idea of signs and proof, I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he has sent you, him, you do not believe. So Jesus is right here speaking about the necessity to believe in him to have eternal life. Then in John 6 he says that believing in him is the means by which a person can have eternal life. This is the work that God's commanded. That you believe in him that you may have eternal life. Now, let's go back to John 6 and verse 32. Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven. Which is, he didn't. Moses did not give you bread from heaven. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives his life for or to the world. Now what is their response in verse 34? Same as the woman of the well in John 4. What's she say? Or what, is, what do they say in verse 34? Give us this bread evermore. Always. Give us this bread forever. So then Jesus said in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. So we have, we'll just call this, coming to and believing in Jesus And I want, to use his, I want to use his terminology. Shall never hunger, hunger or thirst. All right. So now, what do we got? Belief in Jesus is the food. Believing in Jesus, what? Never hunger. You say, well, what does all this have to do with verses 51 through 54? I'm establishing a baseline of results. Let me explain. You remember some of our discussions, like I'll talk about different things such as um, uh, Acts 2.38 where it says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. All right? And then in Acts 3.19 it says, Repent and be converted so that your sins may be blotted out. In other words, you're saying the same thing two different ways. So therefore, being baptized in verse 38 of chapter 2 and being converted in Acts 3.19 is the same thing because you have repent on each side plus point B equals remission of sins. So repent and be baptized equals the rem brings the remission of sins and repent and be converted brings the remission of sins. Then being baptized and being converted are the same thing. Sir, and the same thing as being born again, right? So what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm establishing, I'm establishing. I'm, I'm, I'm really going. I'm just going to give away the whole thing right here. That this whole this whole text, this whole context, is talking about believing in Jesus, and he's establishing this in the early part of the text that believing in Him is the key. Now, uh, let's see, I read verse. Uh, no, I did not read verse 38 through 40. All right, now, he says, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, or the Father who sent me, uh, that of all he's given to me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up in the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and what? <laughs> Believes in him should have what? Everlasting life. See 
And believe brings what? Everlasting life. Does everlasting life sound like never hunger again? Eternal food? See, see, all the same. All the same. So verse 40 is believing me in me, you will have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Look at verse 41. Then the Jews complained because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then? He says, I am come down from heaven. Now it's going down to verse 47. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who, what? <laughs> Believes in me. By the way, this is verse 40. I should have been putting these, should have been putting these texts down. He who believes in me, finish it. Verse 47. Everlasting life. Now let's keep going. I want to keep going. Well, 48 is pretty good. It's really short. That's right. I am the bread of life. Now, we have a, we have a, a for lack of a better term, we have a pattern here. Verse 27 says that faith in Jesus is the equivalent to the food that endures to eternal life. Possessing the bread of God which gives life. That's verse 33. That believing in God means never hungering or thirsting. Verse 35. Or that believing in Christ means never hungering or thirsting. And believing in Jesus means you have everlasting life and will be raised in the last day. And then Jesus says the exact same thing in verse 47. Five times. Five times Jesus equates faith in him as being the same thing as receiving him as the bread of life, right? And the result is the same in every case. Now, now, go to verse uh, 49. Right, we'll go to Walter's verse, verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they're dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. So here we have one more time. Verse 50 explained by Jesus' words in verses 47 and 48. So possessing faith in Jesus is the same thing as eating the bread of life which comes down from heaven. All right, now verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. That's verse 51, right? Yeah. Eating bread equals what? Living forever. That's verse 51. Keep reading. Verse 53. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has what? And I'm just going to summarize by saying eating and drinking, okay? For, for the sake of having room on the board. Eating and drinking. In verse 54, brings two things, brings two blessings. What are they? Verse 54. Eternal life. Eternal life. And what else? Raised up, raised up in the last day. Now, go back to verse 40. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him will have what? Eternal life. And what will happen to him, Ryan? He'll be raised in the last day. Look at the connection between verse 40 and verse 54. They are saying the same thing. Because the results are the same. There are two results. 
of possessing everlasting life and being raised in the last day. So if we get, get right here, if seeing in the seeing the Son of God and believing Him brings everlasting life and raised in the last day, and eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus brings eternal life and being raised in the last day, then what do we know? We know that whatever's going on in verse 40 is the same thing that's going on in verse 54. Question, do you see it? Do you see it? Jesus has, has been establishing this pattern five or six times about what it means to believe in him and using metaphors and, and, and uh, 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 I don't think idiom is the right word, but using various terminologies to describe that, then he changes, all he does is he changes terminology, but he doesn't change the result. So therefore, the terminology changes, the result is the same, then the terminology is the same. Does that make sense? Kind of like being baptized and being converted. Terminology's changed. They're still saying, still saying the same thing. Now, I want to look at some practical problems with the doctrine of transubstantiation, okay? Some, pra some practical problems. All right. Number one, somebody open your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 9, verse 4. Move my mama's going to move you up here to Rhonda so y'all can comfort one another. Somebody, somebody tell me what's forbidden in Genesis 9 and verse 4. What's forbidden? You shall not eat flesh with its life in it. That is the blood. Yeah. You can't eat what? Blood. blood. God said the life of the body is in the blood. You can't eat blood. Now, I'm not, that's Genesis, all right? That's patriarchal law. Somebody read me uh, Leviticus 17 and verse number 10. Somebody find me Leviticus 17 verse 10. Who's got it? Sean, you got it? There you go. Anybody that's among that is a Jew or lives among the Jews who eats blood, God says, I will set my face against him and cut him off from among the people. You know what that last phrase means? Dead. When you see he shall be cut off from among the people means eating of blood punishable by death. Todd, that's that's still Old Testament, right? That's still law of Moses. But we have law, we have the patriarchal law, eating blood is forbidden, right? Then we have in the law of Moses, the eating of blood is forbidden. All right, Dwayne, here's your chance. I know you were ready last time. Acts 15. I want you to go to Acts 15 and give me about verse 19 and 20. And then somebody else give me. No, I'm gonna let Dwayne have two. Since I cut him off just a minute ago, I'm gonna give him two. All right, Dwayne, give me Acts 15. Start reading in verse 19. Let me see if that's right. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from all the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual morality, from plain strangled, and from blood. Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogue of the South. There you go. So what's forbidden, what's forbidden in that text? That's consistent with what we've been talking about tonight. Eating blood. Now, go deeper into that chapter to verse 28. And tell me what you find in Acts 15, 28. 
For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from being offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual morality. Good enough, right there. Now note, there's, a, there's been a dispute going back on at Antioch. Is the whole purpose of this. That the Jews have been trying to bind Judaism on the Christians. Saying you've got to keep the law of Moses and the law of Christ. Paul and Barnabas are sent to the elders and the apostles in Jerusalem to get a final, a final de determination on the matter of do you have to keep the law of Moses and the law of Christ. And so what you read... What I said, what Dwayne read the first time was the decision that was made, right? But what was read by Dwayne the second time was what they wrote down to send back with Paul and Barnabas. But Dwayne, read to me again verse 28, and you tell me who is the source of that rendering? Who's the source of that decision? It seemed good, first of all, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit for us to write these things. And the Holy Spirit says, don't eat what? Blood. In every single dispensation of man's relationship with God, the patriarchal dispensation, the Mosaic dispensation, and here in Acts 15, the Christian dispensation that eating of blood has been expressly forbidden. Now, if it is indeed the case, and it is, that God has always forbidden the eating of blood, why in the world would he have us eat blood every single Lord's Day? You see the practical problem with that? God has always forbidden the eating of blood. By the way, let me throw this out at you. Because this was a question of mine years ago. I like my meat really rare. Alright? I like my meat rare. Alright? I you know, the joke is that when they bring me my steak, I want them to have to flip a coin as to whether or not they're going to serve it. Or carry it to the vet and see if they can see if they can save it. <laughs> you know, I want it to flinch when I put a fork in it. All right. Now, when you eat when you eat rare meat, it's got a lot of juice in it, right? But that juice is not blood. All of those animals that are that are slaughtered in a, in a slaughterhouse are bled. They are hung up. Their throats are slit, and the blood is drained out of those animals. And what you have left is not, is not blood. Plus, when an animal, when anything dies, the blood immediately begins to break down, and it's not blood anymore. All right? So, don't you ever accuse me of eating blood just because I like my steak. I like my steak really ready. It's oh. a, it says the same thing in Leviticus 13. Yeah, there's about five. Leviticus 16 and... There you go. The, them. They bled, any animal that is killed is bled before it yeah. is eaten. That's right. That is exactly right. And so, and so, what it, what you have in your on your plate when you eat a steak is not is not blood by definition. So many people here have never killed hogs. Yes, right. <laughs> I, I, I've been around that. So, so. From a practical standpoint, the eating of blood. By the way, there are still there are still societies all over this all over this planet that eat blood. Yeah. I mean, I've seen I've oh, seen no. them I've seen them take an ox, some type of ox or cow, yeah. and jab that thing right in the neck, and sit there with a and sit there with a a, 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 a bucket yeah. and catch the blood. All right, and then they can stop that they can stop that thing up, <coughs> but they drain the blood for the purpose of eating. All right, that's forbidden by the Bible because that is the direct eating of blood. All right, so there, are, in other words, there are still some people who eat that who eat blood. 
a blood sausage, you know, uh, sausage that's made out of out of uh, blood, coagulated blood. That's still, to me, that's still blood, right? But the eating of blood has always been forbidden. Why would God have us eat blood every single Lord's Day if He's forbidden it from the beginning, from the beginning of the time that man started eating meat? Nobody ate meat until after the flood. 1,651 years. Every man, every animal was a vegetarian. Every animal on the planet, every man, every woman, every child was a vegetarian. Nobody ate meat until Genesis chapter 9. That's 1,650, I think 1,656 years. All right? And from the time that man began to eat flesh, the eating of blood has always been forbidden. All right? Secondly, I find something very interesting, and I'm, I, I won't take long on this, because, again, this is more of a practical thing. The incident of alcoholism among Catholic priests and others who practice the use of alcoholic wine in their mass or their Eucharist, uh, there is a high incidence of alcoholism among Catholic priests and Lutheran priests. You know why? Because once that blood is blessed by the priest, it has to be consumed. So however much of the wine that is left over after the Catholic services are over, or the Lutheran services are over, has to be consumed by a priest. All right? Now, I learned this back in, we were in, Paris in 93 to 96. In 95, Edwin Jones came and talked about, came and talked about being a Lutheran and coming out of the Lutheran church. He made the statement. He said, our Lutheran priest was an alcoholic, and everybody knew it. And one of the reasons he was an alcoholic was because all the communion wine that was left unused in the service had to be drank by the priest. And you can go online and you can find that there, there's, an extreme pro, there's a, an extreme problem of alcoholism among Catholic priests and others that practice this same, practice this same thing. In 1996, I heard a phrase that wouldn't have meant anything to me if I didn't know this fact. There was a movie that came out in 1996 called Sleepers. And it had Robert De Niro and Brad Pitt in it. There was a story, Robert De Niro was a Catholic priest, not to go into the story, but in the process, De Niro was talking to one of the altar boys who was preparing for the mass that was going to take place that night. And De Niro asked the young man, says, you remember how to prepare the mass, right? He said, yes, Father, light on the water, heavy on the wine. It's in the transcript, it was in the movie. That line would have not meant anything to me if I didn't know, if I hadn't known that the priest had to drink the wine. In other words, he had, and I really, again, I understand this is a movie, but he had it set, had it fixed so that there'd be lots of extra wine at the end of the service so that he'd have something to drink when he got done. What well, I was in the basic train, I went to a Catholic church with a buddy of mine. I believe, if I'm not right, not wrong, that the priest was on the way to touch the wine, but everybody else went through the line and took away. That's correct. They've changed. Yeah, through the course of time, Catholics now no longer partake of the of the wine. They only receive the bread. Okay. Only the priest drinks the wine now. Only the priest. Now, I want you to think about this. They have they have, for lack of a better term, dry out centers for priests that are set up for priests because alcoholism is such a problem. And I read online from Catholic sources that if you have a priest who is a recovering alcoholic, he can be permitted to use grape juice or what's called mustum, which is a very, very low or non-alcoholic wine in the communion service to help priests who are recovering alcoholics not to have to drink alcoholic wine after the mass is over. But my question is this. What difference does it make what he drinks if it turns into the blood of Jesus? If he drinks it and it becomes the blood of Jesus, how can the alcoholic content of that, of that 
wine have any effect on that priest. <coughs> and yet, even the Catholic hierarchy recognizes that their practice contributes to alcoholism and they make arrangements for alcoholic priests to drink non-alcoholic wine in their mass ceremonies. But that still doesn't answer the question. If it turns into the blood of Jesus when you drink it, how does the alcohol get in his body? Again, from a practical aspect, again, just, just using your good common sense, we can see that, that this, well, us, we understand what this is now, but from the practical aspect of the eating of blood condemned in all three dispensations and the practice, the accommodative practices of Catholicism to help alcoholic priests, we can see the fallacy, the fallacy of this practice. Right, any questions about that? Any questions about that at all? all right, let me turn this, turn this off just real quick.